Welcome to Concordia. Whether it's your first time or you are someone who calls Concordia home, we are glad you have joined us for service today. This is a place where people matter. Hope is real and the love of Jesus is at the heart of all we do. Our service will last about an hour and will include worship through music, prayer, and an uplifting message for your week ahead. If you're here for the first time, we'd like to invite you to visit one of the counters in the lobby after worship so we can meet you and give you a special gift to thank you for checking out Concordia. Children are always welcome in our services, but if you need to step out with them, visit our family room in the lobby where you can continue to watch the service live. Our free app provides a worship guide and sermon notes if you want to follow along. You can find the app by searching Concordia San Antonio in your favorite app store. Please take just a moment to go to our website or our app and hit the word connect. That will take you to our connect card. You can share prayer requests, learn more about serving, and find ways to get involved here at Concordia. You can also text CROSS to 51555 to get the connect card right to your phone. The service is about to begin. Thanks for joining us at Concordia. You are always welcome here. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to worship. My name is Kyle. I invite you guys to stand up with us as we sing this opening song.
Please be seated. Good morning. It's good to see you this morning. What a great time to be together, whether we're here in the sanctuary or online. Welcome to Concordia. You know, part of this morning uh, at the 8 o'clock service was the installation of our newest associate pastor, Jeff Tucker. And uh, I wanted to introduce you. Yeah, I'm kind of happy about it too. I wanted to introduce you to Jeff. Some of you know him, and he's changed a little bit, and to his beautiful bride, Summer, and to my baby granddaughter, Josie. And so here they are. Welcome to Concordia. We're clapping for you. All right. Thank you, guys. Summer, you get to actually keep the flowers this time. Will you pray with me? Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day and for the chance to gather in your name, to, uh, to gather here in the sanctuary, to be together all over, Lord, wherever the electrons go to uh, worship. Lord, we pray as we gather around your word in fellowship with you and with one another that we would grow in our sense of community, we would grow in our sense of great, amazing grace that you've poured out on us, and that it would transform our lives. Lord, all of this we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. worship in the name of our God, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, and we come as we are. But as we are is broken and flawed and sinful, and yet that God who is here with us doesn't turn us away, doesn't reject us, 
doesn't condemn us. He invites us to come close and to lay down all of those burdens we just sang about, to lay down all of that sin and shame and trust His promise that He is faithful to forgive us and wash us clean. I invite you to kneel or remain seated as we confess our sins. Gracious Heavenly Father, we come to you this day and we admit to you the truth that we're broken and flawed and sinful. We've made all kinds of mistakes. It's our words, our actions, our attitudes, even the things we say. But Lord, we're trusting that when we admit all of that, you will wash us clean and set us free through the blood of your Son, Jesus Christ. Dear friends, I invite you to take a moment in confession. Here's the thing that amazes me. God knows everything that I just said to him, and he knows everything that you just admitted to him, and he loves us anyway. He sent his son to do what we could not do for ourselves, to make us holy and to wash away our sin. And so, by virtue of my office as your pastor, I announce God's grace to you, and I assure you that your sins are forgiven in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. There's joy for the morning, O oh, sinner, be still. Earth has no sorrow that heaven can't heal. Earth has no sorrow that heaven can't heal. Scripture. The scripture reading today is from the book of Ruth, chapter 2, where we read from selected verses. Naomi had a relative on her husband's side, a man standing from the clan of Emiliac, whose name was Boaz. And Ruth the Moabite said to Naomi, Let me go to the fields and pick up the leftover grain behind anyone in whose eyes I find favor. Naomi said to her, go ahead, my daughter. So she went out, entered a field, and began to glean from the harvesters. As it turned out, she was working in the field belonging to Boaz, who was from the Eliminac clan. So Ruth gleaned in the field until evening. Then she threshed the barley she had gathered, and it amounted to about an ephah. She carried it back to town, and her mother-in-law saw how much she had gathered. Ruth also brought out and gave her what she had left over after she had eaten enough. Her mother-in-law asked her, where did you glean today? Where did you work? Blessed be the man who took notice of you. Then Ruth told her mother-in-law about the one at whose place she had been working. The, man, the name of the man I worked with today is Boaz, she said. The Lord bless him, Naomi said to her daughter-in-law. He has not stopped showing his kindness to the living and the dead. She added, that man is our close relative. 
He is one of our guardian redeemers. Then Ruth and the Moabites said, he, he even said to me, stay with my workers until they finish harvesting all my grain. Naomi said to her daughter-in-law, it will be good for you, my daughter, to go with the women who work for him because in someone else's field you might be harmed. So Ruth stayed close to the women of Boaz to glean until the barley and wheat harvests were finished and she lived with her mother-in-law. This is the word of the Lord. The children in the balcony are invited to come down at this time for the children's message. Please join me as we confess our faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father of one. Please be seated as the children come forward for the children's message. What's up, dude? Hi, guys. How's it going? Still got some friends coming up. Good morning. That was pretty lame. Good morning. How are you guys? It's great to see you in church. I'm glad you're here. Hey, I've got a question for you. Is there anyone in your life who loves you? Raise your hand if you've got someone in your life who loves you. Okay, all of you should be raising your hands. I'm almost sure of that. Hey, really quick, do you guys know who I am? I'm, I'm Pastor Tucker. I'm Pastor Bill's son. I also work here. It's confusing. We're going to figure it out eventually. But uh, I'm going to be one of your new pastors, and so I get to do the children's message today. But getting back to my question, uh, who, raise your hand again if you have someone that loves you in your life. Raise your hand. Anybody want to share who that is for them? Who, who loves you in your life? Mom, Dad, and God. Mom, Dad, and God. That's a great trio. I, uh, it's a really great answer. Who else? What about you? Family. Family loves us, yeah. Anyone have a teacher that loves them? Yeah, I had some teachers that really loved me and took care of me. What about uh, friends? Who has friends that love them? Yeah. Well, that's good. How many of you would say that sometimes the people that love you also serve you? Raise your hands if, let's say, do you, any of you think your mom serves you on a daily basis? Raise your hand if you, you think she does. What does your mom do for you that you would call service? She cooks for you. That's a big deal. Can we give a round of applause for parents that cook for their children? That's great. Yeah. Mom and dads cook for you. What else do they do for you? They take us to school. They take you to school. They drive you to school. Yeah. Yeah, that's great. What about you? They're there for you. Yeah, if you're sad or if you're feeling down or, or even when you're having a good day, your parents are there for you to care for you. Yeah, see, parents and friends and teachers, they serve you. And service is part of love. Part of the way that Jesus invites us to view love is not just as an abstract concept, right? It's not just an idea or a way that we feel or something we say with our mouth. Part of love in Jesus' world is service. It's to serve one another. So what are some ways in which we can serve the people that we love? What do you think? You know what I have a good answer? Hugs. Hugs. Hugs are great service. Yeah, I completely agree. What else? What's another way? Who could maybe afford to pick up their room when they get home? Raise your hand if you've got a mess room. Yeah, that's a good way in which you can love and serve your parents and show them respect. That's a good way. What else? How could we maybe serve our teachers in love? What's a good way to serve your teachers? What do you think? Not talking when the teachers are talking. Yeah, I got a, I got a little sister that's a teacher, and I think she would love that. 
Yeah, so you see, there are lots of different ways in which love becomes not just something we say or something we think, but love is something that we do when we serve one another. So do you think you can serve someone in your life this week? Yes, maybe? Can I get a resounding yes? Yes. All right, I'll take it. All right, let's say a word of prayer. Repeat after me. Dear Jesus, we thank you for your love. Thank you for serving us and saving us. Help us to love one another in word and deed. In your name we pray. Amen. All right, guys, thanks for coming up. You can go have a seat. Sing another song together. This song is called God So Love.
Jesus is waiting. God so loved the world. I want to take a minute to welcome all of our guests and visitors, whether you're here in the sanctuary or online. Welcome to Concordia, and in particular, if you're here in the sanctuary, I'd love to have you stop by our Visitor Welcome Center. If you go out the center doors, it's just off to the left, and they've got a gift, and we'd love to have you take this gift home. It'll remind you that you've been here, but it'll also remind you you are always welcome to come back and be part of this family of faith. For those online, what a wonderful thing that we can be together, but know, if you're ever in San Antonio on Sunday morning, we would love to have you come and join us right here for worship as well. Ushers, we you feel come forward, we'll gather our offerings at this time. If you don't mind helping them pass these pews along, you're welcome to use the offering plates for your tithes and offerings this morning. Uh, if you prefer, you can certainly give online. You can do that by going to concordia.cc, or you can use our Concordia app. You can find that in the app stores, and you can give right through there. But thank you for your generous support of the ministry of Concordia here in San Antonio. As the ushers are finishing up their work, I want to remind you of a couple of things. Number one, we believe in prayer. And that's why we'll spend some moments here in prayer together. It's also why we create a prayer list every week. And if you have something on your heart or mind, someone you want to add to that prayer list, feel free to do that. Go to concordia.cc and then slash prayer. And that'll open up a, an opportunity for you to include someone on the prayer list. Also, you can go to, you can add a, a prayer request through the Concordia app. Again, you can find that in all of the app stores, but it's right there in the menu list of items that you can do, things you can do, is include a prayer request. I also would include, encourage you, at the end of the service, we have prayer partners. They'll gather right down here in the front of the sanctuary. They're here to pray with you confidentially and privately, and if you have anything on your mind that you want to pray about this morning, know that they're here specifically for you. Right now, I'd like to invite you to join me in a few moments of prayer. You're welcome to kneel or remain seated as we spend this time in prayer. Gracious Heavenly Father, thank you for this day and for the goodness and blessings and love that you pour into our lives. Lord, you set us apart. You make us holy through your love. Pray, Father, that you will allow us as a congregation to bless this community, to transform it by your love in action. Heavenly Father, we also pray for our nation. We ask, Lord, that you would be with our leaders and, and those who govern, those who lead in other ways. Lord, give them wisdom to lead according to your precepts and your principles. Allow them to be faithful and to serve in righteousness. Gracious Father, we pray for our military for our first responders, for all who serve in emergency roles. Lord, bless them and keep them safe in your care. Allow them to, to conduct their work faithfully and well and allow us to show them the appropriate honor and respect that's due. Heavenly Father, we pray for all who are suffering with illness or injury, those who are facing surgery or recovering from it. We pray, Lord, for those who are dealing with end-of-life issues and perhaps in hospice care. Be with all of the people that we've mentioned, all of their families. Comfort and strengthen them in these times of trial. Lord, bless them in the midst of it and allow them to know that you love them so much you will never leave them or forsake them, that nothing can separate them from your love for them. Heavenly Father, all of these things we bring to you this day in the name of your Son, our Savior Jesus, who has taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Please be seated.
Good morning. God's grace to you. It's uh, a little surreal to be standing up here. I've watched, uh, watched the old man preach up here quite a few times in my life. Been a part of this church in one way or another for over 20 years. Seen lots of pastors that I love give great sermons up here. So it's strange to be standing up here. I uh, was talking to a buddy of mine from SEM who was asking me how I was feeling. You know, going back home, being in your home congregation, getting ready to preach your first sermon at your home congregation. And I said, well, you know, I'm, I'm nervous. I know these people pretty well, at least a lot of them, and I want to do a good job. I don't, I don't want to make a fool of myself. And he said, I'm sure you'll do just fine. And then he said, or it could be a huge disaster. <laughs> could go either way. So hopefully it's not a huge disaster, but we're in this together. So here we go. We uh, last left off in Ruth 1. We were introduced to this beautiful story of these two widows, these two women, Ruth and Naomi, and they have gone through extreme life circumstances. Naomi has lost her husband, and she's lost her sons, both of her sons, and Ruth has lost her husband, which makes them destitute. It leaves them fundamentally without aid, without provision in their culture, and their economy, in that society at that time. And so you see this dire situation of these two women. But what you also see in Ruth 1, which is really beautiful and really part of the astounding part of the book, is you see Ruth make this beautiful commitment and this promise and this vow to Naomi, who she didn't know a single thing. But for some reason, Ruth binds her life to Naomi. Where you go, I will go. Your God will be my God until death parts us. Beautiful words in the midst of a horrible situation. And so these two women are traveling back to Naomi's hometown of Bethlehem. They're getting there just in time for the barley harvest. It's a, it's a play on words, right? They're coming from famine. Now they're coming to Beit Lechem, Bethlehem, the house of bread at the barley harvest. You can see where the story is leading us, right? And so we pick up. Ruth is the outsider. The people of Bethlehem have noticed. They say, why is this Moabite woman here? This would be weird in that time, right? We just finished Judges. So we're going to jump in at Ruth 2, verse 1. Here we go. Now Naomi had a relative on her husband's side, a man of standing from the clan of Elimelech, whose name was Boaz. A couple things to note. First of all, the author is already giving us some uh, foreshadowing, some warning of what's about to happen. We're introduced to this man, this relative of Naomi. Is it by blood? No, it's by marriage. Her husband's relative, Boaz, from the clan of Elimelech, he is going to factor prominently into the trajectory of this story. And so the author is giving us this foreshadowing right at the beginning of the chapter. The second thing to note is how is Boaz described? He is a man of standing. In Hebrew, a gibor chayil. Uh, It it can mean a couple different things. It has a, a few different translations. You heard this same phrase used to describe Gideon in the book of Judges. Anyone remember Gideon from maybe the series Judges or anything like that? A few hands. Uh, He was described as a gibor hayil, and that that specific passage meant that Gideon was a, a man of valor, right? He is a warrior. He's a general of Israel's armies. He's going out to fight battles, accomplishing amazing deeds. So that's one way you can translate it. Another way to translate that phrase is he is a man of significant economic means. That would make sense given the the context of the story. But the third, and and my preferable way of translating this phrase, one way you can gloss this phrase is uh, a gibor chayil is someone who is honorable or upstanding in their community. I prefer that translation because when you read Ruth, especially after you've read Judges, the scale of things has dramatically decreased, right? We are dealing with people simply making choices in the intimacy and the smallness of their very community. All of the profound things that happen in this story happen at the smallest scale. And so Boaz is described as a man of honor, an honorable, upstanding man. And he's going to be important to the rest of the story. Verse 2, And Ruth the Moabite said to Naomi, Let me go to the fields and pick up the leftover grain behind anyone in whose eyes I find favor. This is not a simple proposition for Ruth either. Number one, she is essentially declaring to her whole society that she is on welfare. 
That's what it means to go and pick up grain. To glean is the word in Hebrew. It's lakat. We'll get to that in a second. Ruth is going to go to those fields, and she is going to glean with all the other people who cannot afford to buy their food or who don't own land. She is going to be one of the people who is living off the welfare of the land. So she is declaring to everyone that she is in need. She is at risk of fellow gleaners, people who also desperately need the food that's available. She's at risk from the harvest workers who probably don't want this woman messing with their product. And number three, she is at the mercy of the landowner. Will he allow these people onto his field? It is not a safe proposition for Ruth to go into the fields by herself. There's this guy, uh, Tim Mackey, and you saw it. That, that word for pick up is, like I said, lakat. It's Hebrew. This guy, Tim Mackey, how many of you have seen Bible Project videos? Anyone? A few people. He's the brain behind that. Really smart biblical scholar. And he uses this phrase to describe certain words, phrases, and images in our scriptures. He calls them hyperlinks. Anyone here use a computer? All of your hands should be up. If you're not, what's going on? Hyperlinks. And the idea is a, a hyperlink is not, is not an accident, right? It is something you embed into a web page. It's a link, usually through a word or, or through a, an actual address, in which you can click on it, and it's there for a purpose because it's meant to take you to another page, right? And so Tim Mackey calls certain phrases and images and words in Scripture hyperlinks because what they're meant to do is they're, they're design features, they're divine design features, in which they're meant to elicit and evoke a, a, a remembrance, a remembering of a passage that you read before, something else that comes up in Scripture, or a pattern maybe that you've seen throughout Scripture. And so one of those instances is this Hebrew word lakat. It's, uh, it's used by Ruth when she says what they translate as pick up. It's actually lakat or glean. And it's uh, this idea of going into the fields and you gather what's fallen to the ground from the harvest workers. You're just picking up their scraps, essentially. And so that word, lakat, it takes us to a really uh, interesting part of the Bible. It comes from the Torah, from a very specific part of the Torah, in what I think is just about everyone's favorite book of the Bible, Leviticus, right? And Leviticus, how many, when was the last time any of you read Leviticus? Who, raise your hand if you read it in the last year. Okay, the truly righteous are raising their hands right now. That's good. No, uh, Leviticus is a weird book. It's hard to read, for one. A lot of the rules, regulations, and laws don't make a lot of sense to us, but Leviticus is important because Leviticus is the laying out of the law. So God has taken Israel, and He's claimed them. He says, you are my holy people, not by virtue of your work, but because I'm claiming you. And as my holy people, for you to live in community with me, for you to live in righteousness with one another, for you to live holy and pleasing lives before your God, here is my law. Obey this law. Live in this law. Form your communities around this law. And so in that sense, Leviticus kind of functions like, uh, well, how many of you remember those four dummy books that were popular in the 2000s? There was like computer programming for dummies or Spanish for dummies or how to have a conversation for dummies, that kind of thing, right? The Leviticus is like holiness for dummies. It's saying, you really can't figure this out on your own, so I'm going to boil down this abstract concept, holiness, and I'm going to make it accessible to you. I'm going to make it human to you, something you can live in and participate in. And so Leviticus is holiness for dummies. But you see in Leviticus 19, after a bunch of commands about sex and marriage and food, what's kosher, not kosher, about sacrifice, the different kinds of sacrifices you make. You get all sorts of rules and regulations for the priests and their garments and the tabernacle. And then in Leviticus 19, you get to a section that starts dealing with the meat and potatoes, how human beings are meant to live in community with one another. This is God's holy command to His people, the codified law of God for Israel if they are going to be holy and distinct from all the other nations of the world. So Leviticus 19, verse 9, it says this, When you reap the harvest of your land, do not reap to the very edges of your field or gather the gleanings, the valakat, right, connecting us back to Ruth, of your harvest. Do not go over your vineyard a second time or pick up the grapes that have fallen. Leave them for the poor and the foreigner. I am the Lord your God. If you continue reading, chapter 19, verse 33 says this, When a foreigner 
resides among you in your land. Do not mistreat them. The foreigner residing among you must be treated as your native born. Love them as you love yourself. For you were once foreigners in Egypt. I am the Lord your God. That's profound stuff. If Leviticus really is holiness for dummies, if Leviticus is this codified version of understanding what it means if God has claimed a people from one land and taken, him, taken them as his own, if these are the holy people of God and this is the command as God has given it, then love, mercy, compassion, a mindfulness for the poor, for the least fortunate amongst our communities, is crucial to the identity of what it means to be God's people. It is not, love, service, and compassion is not just something they do, it's who they are. It defines them. It's what makes them unique from the rest of the world. And so Ruth is going to take advantage of this command. She's going to go to the field because she has no other choices. Naomi said to her daughter, go ahead, picking up in verse 3. So she went out, entered a field, and began to glean behind the harvesters. As it turned out, the text says, which is like an inside joke between you and the author, right? Oh, what a fortunate coincidence that this Ruth gal ended up in Boaz's field. Wow, what a fluke of the universe that something like that could happen, right? You're reading that and you're thinking to yourself, that's not a fluke at all. That's not a fluke at all. That's God's providence at work. That's God leading Ruth's feet. There is no circumstance anymore. There is only God's will at work. God leading Ruth's feet. God guiding Boaz to go to his field to notice Ruth. There is no more flukes in the universe. There is only God working in the details of life. And so as we go into this text, I, I dare you to consider what am I considering fluke that is actually God's work in my life? Where are the details of my life where God's providence is being seen if I would just open my eyes? So she goes to the field and she's working, and it just so happens that Boaz seems to come out at that time when Ruth is in the field. It says, when Boaz arrived, he greeted the harvesters. The Lord be with you. The Lord bless you, they answered. Boaz asked the overseer of his harvesters, who does that young woman belong to? The overseer replied, she is the Moabite who came back from Moab with Naomi. She said, please let me glean and gather among the sheaves behind the harvesters. She came into the field and has remained here from morning till now, except for a short rest in the shelter. And that could be the entirety of the whole story. What is the law in Leviticus? What did it say? When you glean your field, don't glean to the edges, right? Has Boaz, by allowing someone like Ruth or other people living on welfare to come to his field, has Boaz lived in accordance with the law as it's written in Leviticus? Yes or no? Yes, he has. So has Boaz hit his holiness quotient for the day? He's, he's been holy at least once today. He can check out. He can say, sayonara, good luck, Ruth. Hope you uh, find whatever you're looking for. Is he good to go? What do you think? Does that sound right as I say it? No, but uh, do some of us maybe live this way? I've hit my holiness quotient for today, God. I did one good thing. I didn't actively harm anyone else. I'm kind of checking out emotionally from the people around me. Anyone ever feel like that? Even as a pastor, I promise you, I feel like that. All of your pastors do at some points. What's astounding about this book, and what, what's astounding that you're going to see in the example of Boaz, is that there's something to Boaz. There's something in the way he lives. There, there is no miraculous in the book of Ruth. There is no explicit command to Boaz, hey, when a widow from Moab comes to your field specifically, Boaz, that's not in Leviticus. You're not going to find it. There is just this willingness to live in the spirit of God's law. Not, not the codified, not the written out law, not the explicit don't glean your field too much or don't harvest your field too much, Boaz. It's something more than that. And that's what's profound about the book of Ruth. It's not that there are great miracles. It's not even that you can hear God speak directly, but you see Him in the interactions, in the minutiae, in the details. 
you see the example of Boaz, a man who is a landowner, you see God profoundly working His providence in the love and compassion that He has for this widow. Boaz, he doesn't owe Ruth anything else, and yet he's going to insist, you will be protected by my men. You will drink from their water vessels. You will eat with me at my table, and I will send you home with food. I'm going to keep loving you. I'm going to keep serving you. I'm going to go above and beyond what's written in the law because I live in the transformative power of the spirit of the law, where the law becomes not just something you do, but it's who you are, and so it changes fundamentally how you see the world, and so you live a life of compassion and love for your neighbor. It's not something you have to be explicitly told to do anymore. The law transforms It gives new identity for Israel. What it means to be holy is what it means to love your neighbor. It's not about what's written. It's about what's been done to you. Why would God require this of His people? The answer is really simple. If they are going to be the people of God, if they are going to be His image bearers, His representation throughout the world, then when the world sees Israel, they should see the kindness and the compassion and the love and the mercy of a God who isn't content to watch widows in despair, who isn't content to watch people living in welfare, who isn't content to watch people suffer from wildfires and loss of job, loss of career, loss of spouse, loss of family members. He's a God who intercedes in human stories through human means, to fundamentally change lives and bring hope. If Boaz is a living example of that holiness, then it should be seen in the way he speaks to this widow, the way he loves this woman, not out of obligation, but because of what has happened to him when his God made him holy. This is the God that we worship. A God who asks nothing more of us than complete transformation by His power in Jesus Christ. So Boaz loves and loves and serves this woman that he has no obligation to because the Spirit has moved him beyond obedience to identity, to the highest fulfillment of the law, to live in the truth of the law, which is to love your neighbor, is to live as the very hands and feet of your God. And so we see, if you go down to 17, wrapping up the chapter, Ruth is coming back, right? She's been treated nice all day. She got to eat, she got provided, she got water, she, was, she had protection. So she gets back and she's got an ephah of, of threshings that she's gathered over the course of the day. And that's, if you don't know that word, it's like 30 to 50 pounds that she's collected. How many of you think that a typical gleaner on a day in the field gets 30 to 50 pounds of product? How many of you think are walking away with that amount? Raise your hand if you think more than one. Yeah, this is completely unusual. It would have never happened. This means that Boaz has gone out of his way and explicitly instructed his workers to do their job less well. Imagine your boss tomorrow says, hey, I really need you to be like 10% worse at your job. How nice would that be? But Ruth comes back, and her mother-in-law, Naomi, sees this, and she asks her a question, a pretty reasonable question. Naomi sees in verse 19, and she says, where did you go? Where could you have possibly gleaned today? Where did you work? Blessed be the man who took notice of you. And then Ruth tells her the name of the man who blessed her. The name of the man I worked with today is Boaz. And Naomi cries out in verse 20, The Lord bless him. He, not Boaz, but God working through Boaz, God working through the actions, through the small choices in in the intimacy of his own community, God working through Boaz, Naomi says this, God has not stopped showing his kindness, his hesed, his loving kindness to the living or the dead. God's loving kindness is not forgotten by me, 
by my husband who I've lost or the sons who I've lost. Because of Boaz, I see that my God's loving kindness is still for me and it's for those that I've lost. Because of the actions, the small actions of one man to one woman. Boaz didn't know going into that conversation that I'm going to change the trajectory of salvation history. He simply lived in the fullness of the identity of holiness that his God had given to him. And it changed lives. Think where Naomi was one, exactly one chapter ago. We're in Ruth 2, verses 20. In chapter 1, verse 20, Naomi is saying this about God. Call me Mara, bitterness, because the Almighty has made my life very bitter. The actions, the simplicity of kindness and service and love between one man and one woman, a widow who has nothing else, fundamentally changed the outlook of a person's life. To know and believe and to see because of the person they interacted with that God is still at work in the community and in their life. We have the chance every single day to stop viewing things as fluke circumstances or as a coincidence that we run into people or that people come in and out of our lives, but to view it all as providence, as God leading you to the moment you're in and the place you're in to serve this city right now, to serve and love your neighbors, to give to them out of the mercy and kindness that you have received from your God. How many of you are familiar with Love Essay? Anyone here? You've heard about Love Essay? Love Essay is the initiative that was started in 2021 and the idea is by, by service, by serving our community, by inviting people onto our campus, by creating partnerships with organizations and people in the city, that we can actually be a blessing to San Antonio. That we move beyond what happens here on Sunday morning and we're actually in the community loving people who need help, who need rescue, who need to experience God's loving kindness through us. You are the means. You are the instrument. You are the way in which God will show His love, His mercy, and His kindness, if only you would believe in that. God's providence is at work in each of us. And we saw it in something like there was a shoe drop through Love SA. A simple idea, really. You collect donated shoes, you put them in a room, and you allow families to come onto this campus and buy shoes for free. Walk away with free shoes. Because, and think about the need that exists in the community. They have to come here because they cannot afford to buy shoes for their children to start school. But for one day, they came here, they didn't have to worry about money. They experienced the love of Jesus through people who say they love Jesus. And so the love of Jesus became real. It's not just an abstract idea. It's being lived out in a community. And so they came to this campus, and they got shoes. And it's so simple. But it's profound. It's life-changing. And every day you have a participation in that holiness. It doesn't even need to be a service event. It's just the details of your life. It's the way you love and treat one another. That's, what, that's what's miraculous about Ruth. It's not signs from heaven. It's not lightning bolts. It's not a pillar of fire. It's that people in a community, and think about the world we live in right now, it's the idea that people in community can actually love and serve one another. That's what's profound about Ruth, and that's the profound invitation that our God has given to us because He has made us holy. So I pray that you will start looking in the details of your life, in the people you run into, that we will see the opportunity to love and to serve and to actually bring hope. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord God, you have invited us into a newness of identity. To share in your holiness, Lord, it is something you have given to us by the power of Jesus Christ, and so we receive it. And we pray that through your mighty work, Lord, through the power of your Spirit, that we would be your image bearers on this earth, that we would live holy and pleasing lives, that we would love and serve the people around us, that we would be the hands and feet of Jesus, Lord, in the smallness of our community, in the minutia of our everyday interactions, Lord, that you would work 
through us. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Now receive this blessing. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you his peace. And as you leave this place, go out into the world and shine like stars in the universe as you hold out the message of life. Amen. with us, Concordia. Y'all have a great rest of your day.